Welcome, and thank you, Black Enterprise, for hosting this year's Women of Power Tech Summit. Welcome to Innovation, Building a Better Mousetrap. I'm your moderator, Juma K. Dada, and I'm the founder of the Tech Women Network, an online platform for diverse technical women, and the creator of the Hue Tech Summit for Women of Color Technologies. Presently, I'm working on the Making Space Initiative to ensure that there is more diversity in the field of cybersecurity. Talking about mousetraps as it relates to our careers is very timely. Whether you've just encountered one, you've navigated around one, or you're just coming out of one, at some point in your career, you've experienced a mousetrap. That's why today's conversation about the topic is so important. And I'm thrilled to be able to discuss this topic with some amazing experts. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce today's panelists. We have Lisa Bell, Manager, GM Brand Experience at General Motors. Chanda Collins, Assistant Vice President of Project Program Management at AT&T. Kirsten Harris, co-founder of Her Ride. Janelle Robinson Edwards, Executive Director, Human Health IT Strategy and Value Realization at Merck. Okay, ladies, glad to have you here. So let's just jump right into the questions. So uh, we're talking about innovation. Uh, can you tell me what drives innovation for you? And we can just go around. Oh, sure. I can start. Hi. Um, innovation, I think, just comes from this personal belief that I have that change is constant. Um, so you can either be on the forefront of that or sort of running to catch up. Um, but as someone, you know, who believes in innovation and that change is something that we can't escape, I think that we can always do a little bit of digging, whether it's personally or within our professional careers to understand um, what we can do either individually or on a team or as a group or, you know, as a company to make life easier or, or, or bring some sort of peace of mind to a group by, you know, changing something that you know, that they're faced with there, there's always something that I think can be changed for the better. Um, and innovation is really digging into and finding those things and making some small steps for improvement. And for me, innovation and creativity go hand in hand. They're like my twins. One can't go without the other. And given that creativity is one of my core values, I'm always looking for ways to create, to innovate, to make things better. So that's where I find it. I would say for me, uh, necessity drives innovation. I wouldn't necessarily say I'm the most creative person, um, but when you have to do something, when there's necessity around it, then it forces innovation because if you don't have enough resources, you don't have enough people, you don't have enough time, then you become very creative very quickly and allows you to innovate. Um, coming right after what Janelle just said, I'm not the most creative person, but I know I'm a leader in a group of creative people. And something I realized early on, you don't have to be creative to actually work on a product and that you're able to actually work on something that's already been invented already. So pretty much I believe that the wheel was kind of meant to be reinvented over and over and over if you wanted it to be. Excellent. Excellent. And I know that each of you come, you're coming with, from different backgrounds and you're in different settings. So whether you're an entrepreneur uh, navigating, climbing the corporate ladder, or if you're an entrepreneur just trying to, you know, figure out how to get, get that next deal, how, what, does entre what does innovation look like in your world? Especially like you, Janelle, in the uh, pharma world, you, and you have different constraints. I'm just really curious about what innovation looks like in each of your uh, world. Yeah, so I can jump in quickly and say that you're right. I work in the pharmaceutical industry. I've worked for Merck for 20 some odd years. Merck is a 130 year old company. So you can imagine kind of the, the company culture is a bit conservative. And, you know, we develop very innovative products, um, our medicines are quite innovative, and that happens. But I think for the rest of our company, we have to, as leaders, create the space for people mm -hmm. to be innovative. We have to allow them the freedom to fail fast and to 
to have that culture. Uh, historically, our culture is very regulated. Um, we have a lot of compliance that we have to worry about. So making sure that we create the environment and pockets for people to be creative, to have that innovative mindset is very important. Excellent. And for me, um, I, I know I'm in a technology telecommunications company, but really innovation goes beyond just getting patents and Nobel prizes, right? Innovation here is anything from launching new products to actually improving processes, to improving the ways we communicate with our customers. I mean, innovation is basically anywhere and everywhere. Yep, I agree. I work for GM, so innovation for a vehicle company, I think, um, goes a little bit far and beyond, you know, what I think is that face value of creating best-in-class vehicles. Uh, we're also working really closely on software-defined vehicles, so innovating the way that you drive, the way that you experience being on the road. Um, and I think, you know, even being in this space, even as a marketer, is, is truly, truly impactful um, because we get to be really creative and think through different ways to tell those stories, to draw those connections, to really bring home those proof points. Um, and and I, I think that the, in, in a world where innovation is constantly happening and very, very quickly, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's a really great space to be in. Um, from my background, I work in the startup space with a lot of tech companies and pretty much with us for innovations, pretty much <laughs> finding a problem and selling a solution within a new project from an old framework. So we try to look at things that were created before, but try to figure out, you know, what, what's going on in the community within this project or within this framework, how can we make it better for the community? Thank you, Kirsten. And that's that's actually a really good segue because it's it's one it's one thing to be in a, innovative, uh, but there's it's another thing to have a strategy to actually execute whatever that new innovative thing is. So can you guys talk to us about your your approach to, you know, getting, landing a new project or getting your foot in the door to get a meeting, anything like that? Like, what is your actual approach that you can share with the audience? Yeah, um, I have a three-pronged approach to that is do the research, find the hook and make the pitch. So a lot yeah. of the first step is backlining, understanding what audience you're trying to impact, what part of their lives you're trying to impact, what their needs are, and then find that hook. How does your company or that product or what you're trying to innovate on, how does that relate back to them? What's that proof point that they're going to believe in that you can sort of hone in on um, as why this thing or this process is important? And then you make the pitch um, for meetings sometimes to get your ideas heard. It's, it's really, hey, here's why I think what we're doing should be moved in X, Y, Z direction. Or here's the new audience that I think we should talk to. Or here's why I should be <laughs> invited to that meeting. Here's why my thoughts are relevant. Um, but I think just sort of honing in on the who, the what, and then how uh, really makes for a more innovative session. And for me, I've got a mantra for this. It's called my break, fix, justify, repeat. And basically, whenever you identify that problem or where you want to innovate, you go in and look at it and see if you can need to break something completely apart and build something new, or if you can just make a slight tweak that will yield big results. And I think one of the key things that a lot of innovative um, new things miss is justification. You need to justify. You need to figure out how what you're developing is going to drop to the bottom line. So you really need to think of justification just as much as innovation. I think what Lisa mentioned is like, what's that hook? Like what's going to get them excited about it and why they want to jump in. And then the last item is repeat. We need to be in a constant cycle of innovation. I like that. And I wouldn't necessarily say I have um, a technique around innovation. I just, I'm naturally a people person, so I like building rapport with people. And I find that when I do that, people are more willing to tell, share with me, tell me their ideas, and we can bounce um, ideas off of each other. And it really leads to a greater solution for any problem. Um, I'm really big on data and numbers overall. So, what big, so one big thing that's within my community and everything that I'm trying to grow as a marketer as well with my platform and small businesses is understanding the numbers within the community. So we like to try to pay attention towards what's the need right now, what the audience needs, and what's going on more within um, every form of new startup and business. So then we kind of push more for in an innovation 
uh, in an innovation prospect for us is to pretty much see um, what number is rising the most um, within the problem and like I said, the solution area. Um, when we tend to do that, we tend to solve the customer's issues first, hands on, by creating a project plan with that and kind of just carrying it out. And we notice when the customers in our audience see that we already answered their problem, that's how you move forward into gaining a solid community for us. And Kirsten, I like that you just t touched on uh, solving a problem because that's inevitable. You know, when we're creating and when we're being strategic, it's it's just inevitable that we'll come across a problem or something that we need to deal with. So uh, could each of you share a little bit about your problem solving process? Like, how do you how do you tackle things when they don't go well? I think my initial response to problem solving is usually either get a snack or take a nap. Um, <laughs> that's not always the most practical solution. Um, so I, but, but what I often find in that, and um, a lot of how I approach work is, is through empathy. Uh, so I will give that disclaimer, but I think a lot of that is, is giving yourself grace to say, okay, there is a problem. There's something that I need to solve and being okay with the fact that you may not immediately have that answer. But what I like to lean into is not getting stuck. Um, it's the forward movement, it's the doing more research, or as uh, Shadow was saying, it's maybe breaking it apart to see what went wrong, if there was just one step or a, a whole step, or if you need to start over, but not getting stuck in the fact that something is wrong and pushing yourself to find even one thing that you can change that might lead to a stair step of another thing that you can fix. And, you know, maybe you then solve the whole problem. But what I really like to, you know, hone in on is, yes, something is wrong okay, let's move forward. Yeah. And there's a lot of problem solving tools out there. I wanna kind of give a little shout out to the fact that there are lots of new tools out there to help you with maybe journey mapping, journey mm -hmm. analytics. You know, you hear all the other buzzwords, scrum, getting scrum masters, get, being very agile focused. So sometimes you do need to lean in and use some of those elements to help you solve the problem because by using some of those new tools out there it can really hone you in on exactly where you need to go make a break or a fix i would say that in general i try not to think of a problem as this giant thing i have to break i try and and this kind of piggybacks on the, what lisa said i try and think about small fixes just to keep things moving forward. Um, if I think of innovation in general as this giant thing and that you take it apart and you create this shiny new object, then I would never make forward progress. So I have to think about little tweaks, little changes that, that lead, to, lead to forward progress and uh, potentially uh, innovative ideas. Um, like what Shauna just said, um, in my previous career, I was a technical project manager and I was certified scrum master and every team hated me. Um, <laughs> just outside of just project planning, I believe in planning for future disasters. I believe in like plenty stuff for like future greatness, but that's called a form of like, strategic foresight. And with that, I'm able to create a framework by planning out our exit strategy already before something happens. So people kind of didn't like where I was like, you know what? I know it's going to happen in the future. Like, for example, everything with the pandemic, I already had a game plan for that. Here's how we X, Y, and Z certain things. So I try to have everything in line before it even happens. So that's why some people are like, you know what? I don't even want to work with Kirsten today because she already knows what's going to happen the next day. <laughs> Listen, Kirsten, I totally get it, Chanda. I'm certified uh, Scrum Master Technical PM too. So you are speaking my language. I yes. get it. <laughs> I get it completely. So I guess with that said, how much would you say does does company culture play a role in your ability to innovate? If, uh, if you all can share a little bit about that, that'd be good. It, it's top two and not number two. Um, I think you have to feel like you are in a space where you can be bold and speak across levels. So regardless of title that you feel comfortable and that you feel that you are in a space where you can speak your mind, um, where you can feel like you're not working in a silo. Um, I know that some of us work for large companies and there are times where you can feel like it's just kind of your department against the world. Um, but innovation, I think, really, really comes at that intersection of knowing what you know and then finding out what others know. So being able to work across business units, um, diagonally across titles, um, I think that's really, really important in order to spur innovation, um, not even in large companies, you know, also in small ones, but definitely in spaces where you may feel as though you're 
somewhat close in. And that's, I think, extremely important um, in virtual environments as well, being able to have those spaces where you can interject um, and then and bounce ideas off of people that you may not normally interact with on an everyday basis. And as leaders of the business, we are culture broadcasters, right? And one of the things I think as leaders we need to make sure we do is not give innovation lip service. We need to actually recognize and reward people that take smart risks and innovate, even if that innovation doesn't su successfully implement. So you, you've got to be able to go in there and say, hey, great job for bringing forth the idea, great, even though it didn't make it, but great job and just kind of continue to feed that innovative spirit in people. And so mm -hmm. as leaders, you really got to make sure you do that because culture is very, very important in innovation. Yeah. I spoke a bit earlier about our general kind of corporate culture. Um, I would say that where I've seen innovation as successful is, as other people have spoken about, where the leader of that organization gives the team the freedom to fail without consequence. You know, you they say you win or you learn, right? So even in failure, you learn something new. And if you're allowed to experiment and iterate, then, um, you know, you're, you're winning the game. Yeah. I think the dark side to innovation um, is the fact that there's some companies that are choosing not to change and are choosing not to move forward. I work with plenty of companies for years trying to help them um, in this matter. But that's something you call, I think, founder syndrome is where they're not choosing to change the previous company culture in order to move with the future we are right now. And they're being stuck in the past and their company might kind of potentially fail because they're not choosing to kind of move the flow right now. So I think it's something that's like very much needs to be talked about and trying to introduce some of these founders and some, some of these company board members that innovation is not here to tackle what they built before, but it's too expanded. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very, very good point. And I like, um, uh... I believe what Chanda said, I don't know if you called it culture broadcasters or creative broadcasters, but I, I hadn't heard of that before. And that's, 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 I like that. And so with that said, with us being innovators and, and creators and times, or, you know, maybe you've experienced it where you've come up with something, you've come up with an idea and let's say maybe the idea was stolen or someone else took credit for it, or you just weren't appreciated uh, for it. How did, how did you handle that situation? Um, if it, if it's happened to you? Um, I think, it, it, it's probably happened to all of us at some point in time in our career, but you know the, the approach that I, I have now is you know you live in your life and you learn, and, and sometimes you can let it roll off your back because we are one team and, and we're trying to get you know we're trying to march towards a common goal. Um, and sometimes, and you know, I tell my mentees this: you you do have uh, the right to stand up for yourself, um, and you can just you know tell someone thank you so much for believing you know in my idea so much that you wanted to champion it and adopt it as well. Um, so so thank you for helping me uh, to get that across the the finish line. I really really appreciate your support. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with Lisa. Sometimes you have to recognize it as a team team sport. And you just have to pat yourself on the back and say, hey, I moved the ball down the field, even though this person got it across the finish line. So you have to pat yourself on the back and give yourself some credit, even if it's internal, that you did help in that innovation, even if you don't get the ultimate credit for it. Yeah. Anyone else experienced it? If, if not, we can keep going. Well, I feel like I'm terrible in this department. Um, I think early on, I've been trained to um, checkmark everything from having contracts, to having NDAs, to having proposals signed off on. So whenever it came across as an entrepreneur's um, standpoint, when someone did potentially try to leave with my idea, I had to remind them with the clause that was inside the contract or the NDA. But I went to a school that actually taught us this stuff in high school. They, they taught us about contract signing NDAs. And if you're trying to run a business, you know, how should you run it in a proper way and how you communicate with people? So that kind of helped me. But when it comes to internal, like things work with companies, I work for a corporate company now. Um, if someone wants to piggyback off my idea and try to write off as their own, um, I would like to do a nice formal email, but, you know, a corporate petty email. And I would like to include, you know, <laughs> one party that was there and see some, like, 
I'll CC, I'll CC them all and pretty much say, you know what? I'm so glad that Blank had brought this to you guys' attention. We definitely worked on this together, but I definitely took lead on this. And I'm so happy that we're able to work on this in the future. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you, you can direct everything towards me. That's right. That's right. Okay, so this is so we're talking about like traps and things that we've experienced. And you know, the the this topic is uh about mouse traps, right? So have any of you ever fallen into a, a mouse trap? And if you have, what lesson did you learn? I think that the biggest lesson that I've learned, especially around innovation, um, and sort of falling into that um innovative mouse trap is being complacent. Right, so so you'll solve one problem, you get one product across the finish line, and you're like, all right, well, check, I'm done for the year. That's it for me. I don't have anything left to give. Um, and and then I think by sort of falling into that mindset, you can fall into a rut. And then when the next project comes along, because it inevitably will, you have to sort of re-energize yourself and get realigned and reacclimated to the innovative process, whether that's more fact finding or or, you know, doing research or, or just, you know, brainstorming in general. So I think that the biggest lesson that I've learned or the biggest trap that I've had to sort of pull myself out of is this feeling of, you know, complacency and, you know, one and done. It's, it's a constant process. So you have to do things to constantly keep yourself energized. Yeah. Yeah. And along with complacency, I would say is hubris. You create something really magical everybody's cheering it on, you may get into that mindset of thinking that it can just keep going. And really things become obsolete pretty quickly in today's world, right? 12, 18 months later, it's obsolete. So you've got to be constantly, constantly innovating and keeping it moving and not just resting on the laurels of one thing that you've created. Yeah. And I would say I have to make sure that I personally don't fall into what they call analysis paralysis. So a lot of times I'm working on something and I'm dissatisfied and I keep trying and keep trying when it's fine enough. Right. And then I can push it on to somebody else and have my team kind of help and, and take a look at it. And I'm, I always try and tell myself, OK, Janelle, be early, but not elegant. And it doesn't matter. That's what other people are for. That's what teammates are for. And they'll help it along. So I have to kind of remind myself of that. That mousetrap has came to me in many ways, but I think since because of the age of social media, it's been a little bit worse. Um, you have that fear of missing out um, of everything. Mm -hmm. So I had a tendency to try to always stay on top of every trend, even though I know it's a form of innovation, you don't have to have your foot inside of every single door. And that's how I had products that were pretty much like overselling themselves or they were overdoing it too much, or that was just out there. And I felt like, you know, if I wasn't there with my business, I have a tendency to be behind, will it not catch up? And will people like not like me, but like we spoke, like we spoke about before, everyone loves company culture and everyone loves where you have a community. So you necessarily don't have to fully change and you necessarily don't have to have whatever is new out right now because someone else is doing it. But I think it's the worst part about our generation right now is that there's something every second of the day and we feel like we have to catch up to it. So yeah. It kind of sucks with innovation. It's supposed to be a form of a progression, but it doesn't have to follow along basically with a trend to me. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And that FOMO is real, uh, especially as entrepreneurs. Uh, so each of you are amazing. You've, uh, you know, everyone is able to read your bios. And um, I'm just curious what you would consider to be your um, your your best or biggest or most most important professional accomplishment to date? To date, um, I feel like all my accomplishments are like my babies. You love them all differently. <laughs> um, but most recently, I'm, I'm really, really proud uh, to be a part of the team that's bringing to life uh, Gene's vision for software-defined vehicles. Uh, Altify is this awesome software platform um, and it will be present on the Lyric uh, which also is uh, just a feat of like engineering genius. But these software defined vehicles are really tapping into personal personalization, like bringing to the core of your driving experience things that really matter to you. Um, and in a world where we are constantly being pulled in millions of directions and you know where everything needs to be connected, 
and you know you find peace and solace in your vehicle now there's a way to even enhance that right and bring forth these really uh, software driven but very personable um, always updated experiences into your vehicle is, is something that i'm really really proud to work on and, and can't wait to bring more of that to the market excellent for me i find accomplishment in being in the company for 25 years and being able to innovate in pretty much every job I've been in. And like I said, it's one of my core values of creativity. So whether I was, you know, launching prepaid calling cards or putting in new automatic call distribution systems, or even just revitalizing how we do financial reporting, that's been my accomplishment. It's brought me joy and it's helped me from job to job throughout these 25 years. Excellent. And first, I want to say how Lisa must be a great marketer because she has me wanting to trade in my car and go look <laughs> at this lyric. So, so that's goodness. Oh, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think in, uh, in my 26 years at Merck, my greatest accomplishment is in the teams I've built. Um, I try and hire folks with intention. So I have women on my team. I have people of color on my team. I have veterans on my teams. And it's, it's been this way, you know, with every new team I've built. And I just find that, um, you know, people talk about diversity of ideas, but visible diversity is also quite important to me. And so I think my teams come up with uh, much more innovative approaches and, and better ideas because of the people who are in it. So I would consider that an accomplishment. Well, Right now I'm 23 and I've been doing a lot of projects and things since I was 15 and 16, um, traveling across, doing like tons of things. But the thing that I love that I'm most happy about, um, if you guys ever heard of J. Cole, he loves to scream that he went platinum with no features. And that's something like very big in the music industry. But for me, in the tech industry as a startup person, um, I was able to build an app. Um, and we were able to soar and through numbers and records time within a month with no ads, no marketing. We grew from having zero accounts into having zero downloads in one month to having over like tens of thousands of accounts and over 40,000 downloads. So that's my, like much, sorry, that's my platinum with no feature on my end. I feel like no one else can have done that but me. So I'm gonna kind of hold that on for me because I feel accomplished. That's like, you know, my belt. Excellent. And I like Jake. I like Jake, Jake Cole. <laughs> um, okay. So we've innovated, we've, uh, you know, we've executed, we've solved problems and voila, now we're drained, right? So what is it that you do when, when that happens? So what does your support system look like? Or, you know, just how do you handle the, the, the down when it's time to come down after just doing something amazing? I think when I find those feelings of, of being drained and just not sure where to go next, I have a, a circle of girlfriends that, you know, we've been really close since gosh, probably 2012 at this point, um, that all work in the marketing industry. We work on different products and for different um, companies, but it's, it's great to have a circle of people that you trust, who know your ability, um, who can prop you up pick you up, dust you off, send you back out the door, uh, but also that you can bounce ideas off of. They understand the space, so they understand what you're trying to accomplish. They may not work on the same products, but it's great to have a sounding board um, and an area where you can just literally throw things at a wall and say, does this sound stupid before I take this to leadership? And you can have people who will give you an honest, yeah, you should probably uh, rethink how you're going to approach that, or people who will be in your corner, you know, rattling you and then texting you immediately after the meeting and to be like, what happened? Tell me everything. Yeah, I was once told that there's four, four people that you need in your career. You need sponsors, which we've all talked about, mentors that you all know about. But you also need pushers, that's someone that's really going to challenge you, and lifters. So when I'm drained, I go to that group of lifters, the people that can help lift my spirits, lift me up after failure or a hard day or you name it. Kind of like what Lisa said, a lot of times these are people that are in my industry, people I've known for years. They're kind of my support system. They understand the issues, but you need to, I go to those lifters when I'm having that kind of hardness and the next day I come back in bright, shiny and new. I would say that I have a lot of people that I work with who I consider friends as well, which is good because 
a lot of the times when things that I think are crazy happen, they happen in the work environment. And it's always good to be able to pick up your phone and find that person that you can say, is this just me or was this really crazy? <laughs> and then you can have that conversation. So I have, thankfully, a good group of those folks that I can turn to as well. I have three mercy contacts. I have my mentor, <laughs> my career coach, and my librarian. I kind of live in a library after every project, but um, I kind of instilled this form of work method like inside of me. Um, I believe that your 20s are not your prime. I believe they're your primer. So after each project, I feel like I have to start back over. I have to keep going. And so with every fuel I have at this moment, I have to keep going. I like to trace back to my roots on how I started with everything in my career. I will hop on a bus and I'll hop on a train and that you know, I took a long train ride. And I kind of regroup myself like, you know what, you did this and like you did good and, and it's good to move forward. So I always try to kind of remember to humble myself. Like, you know what? You did a great project, which means you keep going. It's not done yet. It's not done yet. Uh, excellent. Um, okay, so now let's just have a little fun. So I'm really, really curious outside of like, you know, the professional settings. What are some of your like get hype songs or pick me up songs, I'll, I'll say, when you just need a little boost? Wh wh who do you listen to? Yeah. Um, before <laughs> large presentations or if I have to hype myself up for, you know, a brainstorming session or a particularly rough work day. Um, I won't, I won't quote the song title here, but it, it's a wonderful song about someone needing to have her money. And it's, it's very, um, it's very funny, <laughs> but also uplifting. <laughs> um, and it, it's, it's a good song, but it, it, the lyrics, like it's about knowing your value and then wanting to be recognized for what you bring to the table. And that is, I think what keeps me, energized or pumps me up before I need to go do something super heavy at work. I love how Lisa said it's so smooth and so calm because we all know it's <laughs> like this. I really do love it. Um, I might get a little bit booed because they're going to be like, really, Kirsten? But um, I'm a Lil Wayne fan. My favorite song to get hyped to is I'm a millionaire. Like, I'm a young millionaire because I am a young millionaire. So people are looking at me crazy in the gym. I'm like, I keep repeating it. You know what? I'm a young millionaire. So it kind of just boosts me up. I'm like, you know what? I'm next. <laughs> I'll say that as a native Detroiter, my song that lifts me up is Lose Yourself by Eminem. It just has kind of this uplifting mentality and, and sort of makes you want to kind of keep pushing, keep going for it. So that would be mine. And then for me, I like Chanel Monet's Tightrope. I'm always trying to balance between career and home. I'm a single mom by choice of three lovely ladies. So I'm always trying to walk that tightrope in between those two kind of personas. And so that's always my like hype song. Excellent. Okay. And what about, how about when you just need to get away? You you know, and just like es escape. Uh, where is somewhere that you either ever been that you would like to, to go to? I am going to say the English countryside. I want to live my life like a lifetime movie at Christmas and just find a random house that I can Airbnb for a weekend with girlfriends and do like I don't know sheep tours I don't even love being outside I just feel like the English countryside is somewhere that would be super peaceful and just a place where you could sort of stop and reset anyone who knows me knows that if I have a beach palm tree sunshine I am in my happy place so that can exist in many places but a place that I've never been to and always wanted to go are the Seychelles Islands off the eastern coast of Africa. So that's on my list. And for me, I love to quilt. I'm an avid quilter. I know it may not look like one, but I am. And so when I, I would just love to go into a room with the sewing machine, the fabric, and just pick out a couple of quilts, that's like a happy place for me. You guys heard me before. I love books and I love my library and I love the library. There's this library right now that's based out of, I think, 
in Baltimore, Maryland. I think it's called a Peabody Library. I'm not sure, but it's grand books. They're tall. The walls are amazing, filled from head to toe with books. And amazing part about it is, it's also a wedding venue. So I already found my wedding venue. So I'm going to live and breathe and die inside the library for me. And Shonda, I, I have to agree that uh, like the, anything in that realm of like uh, sewing, quilting, crocheting is very therapeutic. Uh, anything that we can do to kind of escape is, is, is welcome. So, uh, thank you ladies for all that you share. Thank you for your authentic authenticity and, uh, just your brilliance and your willingness to, uh, just continue to be leaders, um, for us, for black women. Uh, so thank you for your contributions, Lisa, Kirsten, Shonda, and Janelle. And thank you, Black Enterprise, for hosting this year's Women of Power Tech Conference. Take care.